For, for many years, I was uh, looking at how nature is so good at minimizing its energy use. Like if you watch how a fish swims, they're so much better at than we are. Even our Olympians don't hold a candle to how fish swim. Or even how a common house fly flies. In fact, a fly is the best flying machine on earth or in the air. And remarkably efficient. I mean, if we could emulate what a fly does, our aircraft would use probably 99% less energy. So how does that happen? What, what's nature got going on? So that was my starting position. Actually, I, 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 was, I started on this when I was a little kid, where I used to daydream in class about catching fish by swimming after them. And, uh, and I did a lot of snorkeling and tying to catfish, and uh, they're always so amazingly good at avoiding me. I used to daydream about it, what is actually happening here? And uh, over a period of time, and I noticed in physics class, we were being taught about some you know, basics of physics that didn't seem to match what I was seeing in the ocean. For instance, you know, uh, we were told, of course, the shortest distance between two points in a straight line. So if you want to use the least energy going from one point to the next, like across a football field, you have to go in a straight line. And yet I was seeing in nature, nature never uses a straight line. And subsequently I found that nature's never used a straight line since the beginning of the universe. Not a single instance of it. So it's always traveling in a it's a circuitous route from one point to the other, taking more uh, more time and a longer distance. Now, from a physics point of view, that's all wrong. What I realized over a period of time is that nature always uses exactly the same path, and it's the same path as the whirlpool in the bathtub. And so all movement in the natural world, in fact, even in now, in our built world, where we try to make everything go in a straight line with straight pipes and straight sided aircraft and everything else, nature only moves in spirals. And these spirals happen to be the path of least resistance. And what's really exciting is that this is nature's only mechanism for moving energy and fluids and heat. And it's almost frictionless. So if humans had a machine that was almost frictionless, we'd use almost no energy because we use most of our energy in the world to overcome friction. A little bit for gravity, but mostly it's about friction. And nature doesn't have that problem. It's eliminated friction, basically, mostly, by using these whirlpools. So that's what I focused on and I've um, now created a number of companies over the last many years that uh, do research into uh, the math behind these uh, spirals and how to actually adapt them into the mechanical world. I remember a while back, you, we, we actually, you asked me potentially if I could help you even photograph the whirlpool in order to understand it. So that, that wasn't easy to figure out the shape. It's not just a spiral, is it? That's right. Yeah. Uh, you know, in one way, when you look at it, it looks incredibly simple, you know, because our our environment is chaotic. You walk through a forest and there's not a lot of symmetry anywhere. You know, I mean, pine trees, yeah, they look a little similar, but particularly in the Australian bush and uh, in oak plantations and things like that, there's very little symmetry. Nature's really good at showing chaos. But then you see these spirals like in a tornado or a whirlpool or the curls of your hair or a seashell, and suddenly that, that looks like it's self-similar. Or it's, and it looks simple in a way. It's not chaotic. So if it's not chaotic, it looks simple. Well, in fact, those spirals um, may be more complex than the chaos. 
So it's quite interesting. So, um, and, and mathematically, you can't actually arrive at a vortex. You can't build one mathematically, or if you do, it's not a real one because every whirlpool in our universe, all movement in our universe is called unsteady. If you look at a, uh, the funnel of a tornado, it's constantly dancing across the landscape. So every part of that tornado is changing in relationship to every other single part of that tornado. So what are the relationships? And how do you, can you predict those relationships? And if you can't predict them, how do you exploit this machine? You know, how do you build something that actually uses that? So that was really quite a quandary for me for many years. And, and I've had the great opportunity to work with some of the best minds in America and in the world, for that matter, in this particular area. Turbulence, it's called, and it's uh, the least understood of all the science, sciences. So it's fluid dynamics. And uh, so we've actually cobbled together over the last 30 years a pretty good understanding of how these things work what their mechanisms are and how to actually adapt it into uh, the industrial world. Because I've got some imagery, Jay, why don't you um, give me some examples, like the ones I'd like to seaweed and the reflection of a butterfly wing. You know, when I was a, a kid and, and uh, snorkeling in the, in the ocean there where I grew up, uh, I'd be swimming along a reef, following fish, and a wave would come and it would start to wash me onto the rock. So I'd grab seaweed to stabilize myself. Well, most seaweeds are quite fragile and they break off. So, and I noticed this. And when even the wildest storms and the biggest waves come along, they don't break the seaweeds. Most seaweeds in the ocean hang on even in incredibly hard weather. And well, that obviously is, a really interesting uh, thing to contemplate. And I realized over a period of time that all these weeds, even though they looked like that movement was all chaotic and everywhere, they were all actually changing their shape and shape of whirlpools. And that was my aha moment when I was a teenager, that this is the path of least resistance. So of course, it's the path of least friction. And uh, and so, you know, over the years, I well, and look at seashells. The animal inside a spiraling seashell is kind of like a liquid because he moves, he grows in that seashell in that shape and moves in and out. And he doesn't want to be fighting his own seashell to go in and out. So he's creating the path of least resistance to his growth and also to moving in and out of his seashell. So the seashell actually exactly mimics a whirlpool, so this frictionless whirlpool. And then uh, I, I found in subsequent years that even our heart muscles are in the shape of whirlpools. And our entire cardiovascular system, all the veins and arteries in our bodies are in the shape of whirlpools and our trachea that we breathe in and out of. So all of our functions are in the shape of whirlpools. And we've got 60,000 miles of arteries and veins in our body. And we're able to pump blood through all of that with a tiny, tiny amount of energy in the human heart. 